Hi, I'm Dr. Kesha Malhotra. I'm the lab director of Rainbow IVF. And today we're going to be discussing one of the enigmas that we face in day-to-day -day practice, and that's poor fertilization. Now we know that fertilization rate with ICSI generally varies from 70 to 80%. And despite injecting the best sperm into the best quality egg, we still face this range or we still face uh, an issue within the laboratory, well, we will not get 100% fertilization in each of the patient. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about total fertilization failure, now this is a scenario where none of the eggs would basically end up in fertilization. And it's something which is very distressful for both the patient as well as the clinician and embryologist who's handling the case. Why is it distressful for the patient? Because obviously they don't have any embryos that would be transferred from that cycle. They've invested so much money in, in an IVF cycle and getting a poor outcome, especially where embryo transfer is being cancelled, is generally something that's not acceptable to them. Why is it distressful for the clinician and the embryologist? Definitely because now they have to face a patient and try and explain to them about something which we also don't have a clear-cut understanding about. And that's one of the reasons why it becomes so hard for all of us to counsel patients where there is poor fertilization or total fertilization failure. Now, <clears throat> one of the reasons why people have really shifted from IVF to ICSI was also because of poor fertilization because in IVF, fertilization again varies. If you look at the benchmarks that are there, um, they state that for a good prognosis patient with IVF, we'll probably get about 65 to 70% fertilization. But in some of these scenarios, we will get fertilization as low as 20% or 30%. And these are challenging scenarios where then coming up with a cause of not doing ICSI, then coming up with a cause of why fertilization is low, it becomes very difficult for us to explain. So when you look at the statistics, uh, I think 20 to 30% fertilization with IVF can occur in any laboratory on a regular basis without them even noticing unless and until they are monitoring their KPIs because it could be a one-off case. It could be a series of cases in a short short duration, but then their fertilization uh, comes back. But 100% fertilization failure is a rare phenomenon. And if you look at the statistics, it's about 1 to 3% in ICSI cycles and about 5 to 10% in IVF cycles. It is often unpredictable. It definitely leads to a cancelled cycle it definitely leads to a loss of resources, loss of time for both uh, clinicians, embryologists, as well as the patient. And there is so much distress for all parties that are involved that this is something that we really need to try and figure out. Now, what are the reasons for low fertilization? So when we talk about low fertilization, again, it could be patient related where it could be the age of the patient, especially maternal age, that can be a big contributory factor. It could be a poor ovarian response. Poor responders have a higher tendency to have fertilization failure, more because they have less number of eggs. And that's one of the reasons why taking them as a separate like group uh, would be warranted. It could be because of egg related factors let's say it could be the issue an, an issue with the maturity of the egg it could be an issue with oocyte activation as such and it could also be because of the sperm now oocyte activation is also coming through the sperm because of plc zeta and all the other factors that are there but even sperm dna is something that can affect the fertilization potential apart from this lots of technical factors so the skill of the embryologist especially during icsi is an important factor and we'll talk about this and it's also the quality of the laboratory that can actually influence the fertilization rates. So when we talk about the natural phenomena, especially uh, with regards to IVF, whenever an egg has to fertilize, there is a series of events that need to happen in a sequential manner for that egg to fertilize. So especially right from the start, the sperms have to go through the, survive the environment of the vagina first, then go through the cervical mucus, reach to the uh, ampulla of the fellow fallopian tube, get capacitated, get hyperactivated, meet the egg, 
the cumulus will then select the sperms on the basis of hyaluron and binding then the the sperm has to undergo acrosome reaction has to dissolve the uh, membrane of the egg has to then penetrate into the ulema the membranes have to fuse and then obviously nuclear dna is going to get mingled and that will result in fertilization any point during this process if it's hampered or if it's compromised can result in natural fertilization failure any point within this if it's happening within the laboratory and if it's happening in an artificial environment and if that is compromised will result in total fertilization failure within the lab now within the lab let's say if you're thinking about improving fertilization first thing that comes to mind is to do icsi because icsi bypasses most of these checks it, it's bypassing the selection of the sperm it's bypassing the penetration of the sperm acrosome reaction membrane fusion all of this you're just taking a sperm injecting it into the egg and then just hoping for nuclear fusion to happen and result hopefully it will result in a fertilization for the egg <clears throat> apart from this you could also think of activating the egg in the form of using let's say plc zeta uh, micro injection or you could place the eggs in a calcium ionophore media in order to induce oocyte activation there are lots of studies which have now looked at assisted oocyte activation and these are some of the studies that i've mentioned here and most of these are also put in the isar embryology consensus as well so if you want to look at aoa as a separate uh, entity and look at guidelines or look at basically how to proceed with ar artificial oocyte activation in your laboratory this is a good reference uh, document to begin your search with but basically when we talk about the summary of these literatures let's say we're looking at all of the reviews that are there we now understand that yes it's still an experimental procedure yes there should be consents in involved but in these cases where you're getting regular low fertilization or you're getting total fertilization failure artificial oocyte activation definitely helps us in improving fertilization rates it also improves cleavage rates blastulation rates and also implantation rates this is something that is quite significant now the next parameter that we need to basically think of and maybe we can improve in the laboratory is sperm selection now we know that sperm basically has a very important effect on the egg and on fertilization and it was earlier thought that the effect of the sperm generally starts showing from day 3 when the embryonic genome switches switches on but we now know that there are certain factors within the sperm that will start showing its effect right from the point of fertilization so when we talk about oocyte act activation as such it's the plc zeta or is the sperm membrane that's actually resulting in uh, causing oocyte activation the sperm also delivers the centriole to the egg which actually allows proper segregation of chromosomes allows cell division to have basically happen and if it's a compromised sperm you might get abnormal cleavage right from the start or you might get delayed cleavage and these are certain things that we need to consider if we, these are the factors that we are seeing within the laboratory we can't omit that they are coming from the sperm <clears throat> nuclear dna is another important factor and especially if you are getting grade 1 embryo till day 3 and from day 3 onwards you they become grade 2 or grade 3 or they arrest at day 3 then we have to understand that again a, a potential cause for this could be sperm dna fragmentation now apart from this there are other factors that can influence the fertilization rates so quality of the egg is something that we will now pay a little attention to it has been noted that eggs that have multiple defects let's say they, there are lots of defects within the egg you can have vacuoles you can have scrs you can have refractile bodies you can have cytoplasmic granularity zona defects perivitelline membrane debris etc etc now when there are multiple defects definitely in those scenarios fertilization is comp uh, compromised if there's just one defect depending on the gravity of that defect it will affect the fertilization uh, in that manner let's say we just have one vacuole but that vacuole is very large it's centrally located obviously we are going to get a poor outcome from that particular egg oocyte quality also affects the technical skills because there might be certain eggs that might the membrane might just break as soon as uh, it's touched by an injection pipette 
and in those scenarios the skill of the embryologist is also very important <clears throat> when we're coming to the lab itself how we break the ulema also gives us a little bit of insight on what kind of fertilization we'll get lots of uh, research done by thomas ebner on this uh, which basically talks about getting that protective funnel and especially the persistence of the funnel and how long it's persisting for or how short a duration it persists for and that can influence the fertilization rate and when you talk about this injection funnel again you have the staff that's actually um, influencing it so the skill of the embryologist is important you have the quality of the egg or the stimulation that influences it you have the pipette or the micro tool that you're using that also can influence it because let's say it's a blunt uh, ICSI pipette you will get a poor injection in that particular scenario and you might get a lot of resistance uh, when you're doing ICSI for such cases so poor fertilization can vary from just patient factors to lab factors to gametes to so many things that can actually influence it and definitely when we get cases of poor fertilization or total fertilization failure it is imperative for us to actually troubleshoot this look at all the different factors that have maybe influenced that particular outcome and then only come to a conclusion to whether we want to use an additional experimental procedure for rectifying the same or not another important phenomena that we want to consider when we are talking about fertilization is abnormal fertilization and the most common scenario here is 3pn zygotes or basically and 3pn is when there is an extra set of um, dna that's present within the egg now this dna can come from uh, either from the egg itself where the egg itself is aneuploid or it can come from the sperm where either it's a sperm aneuploidy or there are two sperms which are basically fertilizing the egg at the same time with ivf 3pn zygotes can be fairly common and we can have actually uh, studies suggest that you can actually have about 5 to 10 percent of the eggs resulting in 3pns with ICSI it's fairly uncommon and only eggs which show signs of aneuploidy let's say they have two polar bodies or large eggs um, large polar bodies etc result in 3pns <clears throat> and most of the times this is something that can be controlled by the embryologist itself you can also have 1pn zygotes and basically 1pn uh, zygotes represent um, asynchronous appearance of pronucleuses sometimes you can only visualize one and the other ones not come up it could also tell you a little bit about the lab itself whether the lab the temperature within the lab is compromised or not and these are certain issues that can, again can be rectified by having proper quality within the laboratory so when we talk about quality five six things that we want to look at temperature especially during ICSI and subsequent culture as well pH of the media osmolality of the media these are three important cardinal parameters that can affect fertilization outcomes air quality and also the exposure there's this nice publication by Cambridge uh, IVF which actually looked at temperature fluctuations during ICSI and they found out that there are certain micro manipulators also which have more uh, adapt for ICSI which will provide a more constant temperature during the process of ICSI and these are things that can be considered uh, when you're setting up laboratories another thing that you can consider when you're setting up laboratories is actually calibrating the surfaces surface temperature properly and this actually has to be done by taking a thermocouple inserting that thermocouple into the culture media droplet or the ICSI droplet and then placing it on the surface and then calibrating the temperature according to the, to the droplet temp, uh, temperature that is the best way to actually uh, calibrate these surfaces and there might be certain instances where your uh, temperature control might be at 38 degrees or 38.5 degrees but the droplet temperature would be at 37 so that's also something that you would want to basically uh, calibrate apart from this whenever we get a case of let's say fertilization failure or let's say poor fertilization it's important for us to analyze each and every component we want to analyze which culture media was used which uh, ICSI tool was used what was the exposure time who was the embryologist that did it whether there are any recordings of the procedure or not and 
once we've analyzed all of these, we try and make a troubleshooting checklist. And then after doing this, then only we will uh, come to pinpoint what actually went wrong. And there could be hundreds of things that could be involved. And trying to find out that one particular thing that's going wrong might become difficult. And just to make it easier, it is important that one person either records or witnesses the whole uh, ICSI procedure and that person is also responsible for documentation. So if you've documented the lot of the culture media that's used, the uh, if you've looked at the videos of ICSI, if you've basically documented the temperature of the surfaces, skill of the embryologist is anyways uh, tried and tested in the laboratory, you may be able to come up with certain uh, troubleshooting points and then you can take corrective action. Uh, if need be. <clears throat> Last point that I'll discuss with you is about rescue ICSI. Now rescue ICSI is generally done in cases of fertilization failure and is generally done 16 to 18 hours post ICSI itself or post IVF where the eggs have not demonstrated any signs of fertilization and then you do an ICSI after that particular point of time. There are certain reports where there have been embryos that have been formed from it. There have been a maybe a few live births as, as well but we have to understand that once we are doing an ICSI maybe 16 to 18 hours post IVF <clears throat> we've already crossed a threshold of oocyte aging and the quality of the gamete that we're going to get might not be great so having maybe a short IVF insemination protocol might be a beneficial idea here where you co-incubate for a very short duration you will look for signs of fertilization at four to six hours and if the egg has not demonstrated any signs of fertilization and this could be basically having a very tight cumulus no sperm cumulus interaction sperms could be dead uh, or immotile by the time uh, that you observe in these scenarios stripping the eggs off the cumulus and doing ICSI at six hours might be a more efficient way of doing rescue ICSI piezo ICSI is also something that can help us here and basically what we do here is that when we are injecting the sperm along with that an electric pulse is passed into the egg which allows the egg to get that artificial source of activation and can actually help us in improving outcomes and can be less damaging as well. So these are certain things that are available uh, at the moment in the market. Please understand that poor fertilization happens in each and every laboratory and is very subjective to the kind of cases that you get but it is important for us to understand that if we are getting repeated cases of poor fertilization or if it's the same batch of uh, uh, cases where most of the patients have had poor fertilization then there's something definitely wrong within the laboratory or with the skill of the embryologist or with the skill of the procedure and that really needs to be rectified. If you have any questions for me please contact me on my email which is mentioned here or on my social media. You can also contact EART on their email and their social media and we'll be happy to answer your queries. Thank you.